And welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and my guest on the line with us today is Dr. Shirko Abbas, who is a veteran Kurdish politician and the current president of the Kurdistan National Assembly of Syria. Uh, Shirko, welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. Hello, Mike. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your show, and uh, good evening to your uh, listeners and viewers. Very nice. Listen, just let's. I want to get a feel for, help myself and listeners and viewers alike, Try to get a feel for the area that we're talking about. Um, uh, try to help me if you can. Vision. We'll, I'm going to provide Oscar for TV with some maps. Maybe you can send them on. But uh, give me a general verbal idea of what is. What are we proposing that Kurdistan is? Uh, geographically. Uh, ge- geographically, Kurdistan is uh, it stretches from uh, western, northwestern of Iran. Uh, through north of Iraq, north of Syria, along the Turkish border uh, for both countries, and also uh, the whole southeast of Turkey, all the way to the Mediterranean area. This is a, a Kurdish area. Uh, it's about the size of France or a little bit larger, um, roughly 40 to 45 million people. Uh, the Kurds are the largest ethnic group without a nation, um, and they live in that area. There are some pockets also part of Armenia and Georgia as well. So the Kurds roughly, um, you know, it's the largest ethnic group in the world without a nation, and and uh, I'm from the Syria portion. I, I have to tell you, Circo, when, I, when, when you and I first started talking about having you on the show, I had operated from a really wrong premise, to be honest with you, before our dialogue and before I did a little bit of research on it. Having watched the news with the, the U.S. engagement in, in Iraq, I guess over the, over the last decade I'd come to visualize uh, Kurdistan as an independent or autonomous portion of Iraq only. Um, in, in fact, I had saluted your, your people for having been able to withstand the pressures of First to Saddam Hussein, and then all of the different factions that have come and gone over the over the years that have challenged you folks, and you've st- you've stood solid and somehow been able to maintain some some uh, some autonomy. But I had no no idea that it was as large of a group of peoples as I'm learning. Uh, and that's correct. Not too many people even uh, know about us uh, because obviously. We have 22 Arab nations. We have uh, Turkey as a NATO ally. We had one time uh, Iran as a NATO ally, or at least a friend of the uh, U.S. during the Shah, and later on uh, not friend, and now looks like under this administration go in that direction. Um, obviously, all those, uh, they collaborate uh, because Iraq, Syria, Iran, Turkey, they collaborate on the Kurdish issue. They, if, if they were any... Uh, gain in uh, any part of those uh, countries for the Kurds to gain their autonomy would have impacted the other nation. Therefore, they always, when they hate each other or disagree or have uh, differences, they always collaborate and work together against the Kurdish issue. Uh, so the, the money they have uh, and the resources they have and the relationship they had with the Western nation and, and, and obviously other um, world power, uh, they use it to oppress our cause. And, and uh, lastly, because maybe we also don't blow airplanes and buildings and uh, kidnap and cut head uh, off, uh, we don't get that attention. Right. And uh, may, may, maybe that's it. Uh, I, you probably are correct. I, and and, and uh, <clears throat> Tell me something. I'm, I'm looking at, all, and you'd mentioned it, but all of the different countries that this picture I'm looking at is encompassing for Kurdistan I'm I'm a little bit curious if you could help me understand some of the dynamics of each of the country briefly. For instance, when I look at Iran, I see a significant um, amount of, of, again, I'm looking at a map, so I have to think geographically, but a pretty significant slice of their uh, western border seems to be made up of large population of of, uh, Kurds. And so my question to start with, just because Iran and America have got a history of being not so friendly, I'm wondering how the Iranian government and how the Iranian people interact with Kurds and with, and with frankly, with your attempt to be autonomous and, and have a nation of your own. Um, 
obviously the nation of Iran is not uh, happy uh, with any movement uh, in a direction where Kurds, if they can get a uh, autonomy or federalism or uh, maybe independence, uh, uh, so uh, they would lose a big chunk. And in fact, uh, if you were to go uh, four to five hundred years back, uh, or even uh, a little bit further to 1250 during uh, Salah uh, when he ruled uh, that uh, uh, Islam uh, era, he was a Kurd, uh, the Kurdish area almost from the Gulf, uh, uh, the, the Persian Gulf area, and all the way up to Caspian uh, Sea uh, and Black Sea and all the way to the Mediterranean, uh, including Homs and Hama area. Uh, of Syria as well, and the whole North Syria and north of Iraq, very close to Baghdad. So it was much larger, but over the uh, uh, Arabization policies in, in Iraq and Syria, and also the policies of Shah uh, trying to, uh, well, actually, uh, the first Kurdish Republic in, in 45, 46 it was uh, uh, created in there, and the Shah of Iran is basically uh, um, captured the leader. Uh, he was a judge, uh, caught him Hamad, and, and really cut his head off, or, or uh, actually, sorry, hang him. Um, and uh, there was an end of that uh, uh, republic, was the first Kurdish republic in the modern day after the uh, collapse of Ottoman uh, Empire. So uh, uh, the, the interesting point, those area, the Kurdish area, it has a lot of resources in terms of oil, breadbasket, uh, water resources, as well other minerals such as uh, um, like uh, iron and, and, and so on. Uh, so they they would not be happy uh, for losing that, but obviously that area has shrunk uh, over the years. And uh, But still, you're looking minimum 12 to 14 million Kurds live in Iran, and in, uh, north, at the very least north, uh, northeast, of, uh, sorry, northwest uh, of Iran. Uh, d- tell me this, um, is... What- I'm looking at the, uh, still looking at the map. Is t- does Turkey tend to be more f- more friendly to you uh, and to your people than the other the other uh, nations that encompass your your peoples? Uh, obviously, uh, it's all relative. Um, has they uh, have they killed as much as Saddam Hussein? Where uh, he approached hundreds of thousands of Kurds, actually killed and. And, and destroyed more than 5,000 villages. Uh, um, uh, or Iran, uh, I would say they're all in the same ballpark, but a lesser degree. There, there has been a, a change in the current government in Turkey where they're trying to reconcile that issue. But obviously, it's a very um, uh, weak uh, in terms of what they're offering. Uh, and, and that's something uh, remains to be seen how much they're going to go in terms of whether autonomy or some kind of uh, uh, confederation. But it looks like there's some shift, uh, positive shift going on right now in Turkey. But to give you an idea, more than 30 to 40,000 Kurds were killed uh, in Turkey in the last, uh, since 1980s until now. Uh, obviously, there's some peace uh, negotiation with the government and some uh, groups within Turkey. With that number of people that I'm, again, I don't want to a- ask naive questions, but I, I'm afraid I have to. With that number of people, you're talking about a Turkish military um, attack of, Kurdis, uh, of Kurds. Is that is that what we're saying? Well, um, the Turkish military uh, was very active um, in the 70s and 80s and 90s against the Kurds, and, and in fact, they, they destroyed thousands of villages as well, and many Kurds were left there for Europe, left to Istanbul and other cities uh, for refuge. So, yes, they were very active. In the last uh, four or five years, there's uh, some initiative by the government to make some changes in that area in terms of uh, resolving the Kurdish issue. Uh, That uh, number has decreased uh, uh, drastically. But uh, we don't know where this is heading. Uh, in other words, um, it's not very clear how much of a democracy and how much of a change in peace, because there are actors in there. Uh, what I mean by actors, 
as uh, Turkey is trying to make some changes, there are some deep state within Turkish military. They need an enemy and they need a group that they can fight to stay and keep their power. And I think uh, that's one point. The other point is Iran is using uh, the portion of uh, some of the Kurds in Iran and uh, Turkey, uh, some group, Syria and uh, and Iran is using to put pressure on Turkey to back off on Syria policy or any policy that approaches uh, Iran's uh, territory or uh, infringes on his uh, on its uh, uh, I guess interest. So uh, there are some, uh, including Russian as well. They're playing some of this card. Uh, how much of a piece is going to happen? It depends how much uh, the current administration in Turkey is willing to offer that it will be. Uh, um, leading to a more a peaceful and where the Kurds have uh, the rights. But I think within the 20 to 25, the Turks will be minority. The Kurds will be the majority in, in, in Turkey. So in that sense, they need to find a solution. Uh, whether they like it or not, they have to look at the, some solution for the Kurdish issues there. But we know Iran has been playing some uh, with Russia and uh, Syria to uh, derail the process. Listen, I know you don't have the benefit of looking at the map I'm looking at, so I apologize, but just just for listeners and viewers, and please help me if, if you could, I'm looking at an, an Ottoman Empire map that is circa 1914, and it shows the Ottoman Empire that appears to be all of Turkey, most of Syria, most of Iraq, up, up into the edge of what became the Soviet Union. Uh, is, this the, is this the foundation country that most Kurds identify their heritage with? Uh, uh, yes, uh, that's correct. Uh, you know, you look at that map in like 1914. In fact, uh, the founder of modern-day Turkey, Kamal Ataturk, uh, approached the Kurds to gain strength and later on used the Kurds and Armenian against each other by deploying a... Um, divide and conquer and weaken both and finally conquer in both. But during the negotiation, uh, 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 when Allied forces uh, went over um, Ottoman Empire, he was able to manipulate the Severus uh, Treaty and replace with Lausanne Treaty, where the Kurdish name was removed completely. Initially, he wanted to create, it's called Kurdish Turkish Republic or Brotherhood Republic or something in that nature. In other words, meaning the Kurds were first and Turks were second to de- develop a, a new republic. Uh, but when he went, he said he's going in and on, on the behalf of the Kurds and the Turks to uh, make this agreement. Apparently, um, uh, they had made a deal with the British and uh, French uh, to uh, remove the Kurdish name. Uh, any reference uh, to the Kurdish name was not mentioned, and hence, uh, since then, there was a uh, Turkey was created. It, it looks just looking at. I'm looking at a series of maps, kind of flipping through. It looks like the the the, the Kurds once upon a time, as you're saying, had a very large area, and then, then over the last hundred years have just been absolutely condensed and, for lack of a better words, squished down into a much smaller smaller region is that is that <laughs> that that's kind correct. Of correct that's correct assessment there always been uh attempt to change demographic um uh, as an example in syria there was a, a 45 arab settlement built among the kurds along the turkish border brought in arab from inner syria to our area and and they revoked more than half a million kurdish citizenship what well, half a million plus now but it was less at the time, 162,000 in the 1960s, to make them illegal alien in their own country where they had deeds going back to the Ottoman Empire. You know, some of them had like deeds 400 years uh, uh, that they had from Ottoman Empire, yet they made them illegal alien. Uh, so they were before creation of Syria. Uh, same thing in Iraq, same thing in Iran, and of course in Turkey as well. So there's attempt uh, were always made to... Uh, change the demographic, um, especially more under Ba'athists in Syria and Iraq. You know, through, throughout the time that the United States has been engaged in the battles in Iraq, there has been periodic talk 
about the possibility or probability um, or maybe even desirability to break up Iraq into, uh, depending on who's telling the story, three to four different countries. Is that something that, that your organization would support? Uh, could you uh, repeat the question? Because it looked like you were breaking up for a second. Oh, I, I apologize. Okay. I'm, I'm referring to during, during the time that the United States has been engaged in military operations in Iraq, there have been a number of occasions where the discussion has been that Iraq itself may break up with with an area, an area that would be autonomous and specifically for a country of Kurdistan, and then whatever would become of the other two or three sections of of Iraq if it did break up. Is that something that your your group would is in favor of? Well, we're in favor of obviously. Um redrawing the, border, the boundaries of Middle East, the, the psychos Pico agreement uh, is a um, disservice to many groups. To give you an example, in, in Iraq, they let the minority Sunni rule uh, the Kurds and, and majority Shia. In Syria, they let the minority Alawite the rule the Kurds and Arab Sunni. So we they lumped us in both those nations by dividing the Kurdistan into those two and, and uh, diminishing our influence but also the majority of those two countries were uh, sidelined and put other groups in there that they could rely on severe influence, so whether uh, uh, French or British at the time. So um, uh, to answer your question, absolutely. Uh, the right thing, the just right thing, they need to redraw and, and put Kurdistan back the way it should be because the, the area is continuously attached together and it's not uh, packets and the people live in there, and it makes sense for that, um, you know, Germany got united, the Kurdistan should be united as well, and why uh, there's a 22 Arab nation, and they're trying to seek another nation for a three, four, maybe five million Palestinian, why there's not a nation for the Kurds where you have more than 40 million people. Uh, you know, this, this is something, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier on in your program, the influence of those nations and the money and the petrodollar have on the U.S. policy and frankly, you have been a, a counterproductive on the Kurdish issue. In the past, it was a NATO as an uh, ally. But going back to uh, Shah of Iran, the Kurds work with America during um, uh, uh, Nixon and uh, Ford administration was, when, was, uh, when Kissinger was in uh, foreign, uh, uh, what they call it, Secretary of State uh, at the time. And the Kurds were abandoned to Saddam Hussein. Uh, we slaughtered the Kurds. Then also in 1991, during Bush, first Bush, the father, uh, the Kurds uh, uprised against Saddam for American request, and then they were abandoned later on due to the American uh, public pressure and, the, uh, frankly, the media in the U.S. and the West uh, that created the no-fly zone. And, and you can see the result of that no-fly zone. Kurds, they're not even a nation. They have a democracy there as prosper. Uh, it's uh, some of those nations, the Arab nations, been there for 50, 60 years. They don't have any uh, rights or democracy in that area. And they're also still friends of U.S. and not a single American got killed in our area. And they welcome American with flowers and or the Westerners, and they're a friend to Israel as well. So the question, why why we don't support the people share the same values as we do, why I we don't... Sherko, yeah. I, I agree with you. Listen, we, we've got to go to a break, but, but when we come back, we're going to pick up with that and maybe a little bit about what's going on in, uh, with Assad in Syria. Folks, we'll be right back. Are you one of the many Americans who undergo CPAP or BiPAP therapy? Replacing your supplies every three to six months is critical as bacteria will build up and worn out straps cause leaks. Call Allied Medical Supply Network and speak to an expert agent who will set up a schedule for your supplies to be delivered right to your door at little or no cost to you. Call Allied Medical Supply Network today and rest easy. Call 800-284-2512. That's 800-284-2512. 
I've made a discovery. The down-home community our grandparents loved is still here. Seriously, that's what you'll find at Renegade River in downtown Spring Lake. You might be looking for a new or used hunting rifle or something for personal defense. Maybe a DNR sport license or fishing supplies. Personal and home defense. Hunting, Army, Navy supplies, fishing, survival gear, and even a tools and guy stuff consignment department. You'll be greeted by low prices and quick professional service provided by shopkeeper Mike Hewitt. If you're not in a hurry, grab a cup of coffee and join in the conversation. Renegade River, firearms, hunting, personal protection and survival gear, going camping, or looking for emergency products. Come take advantage of the prices while meeting up with old friends making new ones. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Or go to the website, renegaderiver.com. This is a national health alert from Worldwide Medical. Are you on Medicare? And do you suffer from back or knee pain? Have you tried injections, pain pills, or even had or considered surgery? If these examples apply to you or a loved one in pain, stop. There is a better way. You could qualify to receive a pain-relieving back or knee brace at little or no cost to you. You'll receive free information, free delivery, and all the insurance paperwork is handled for free. Best of all, there is little to no cost to you for the braces. Call 1-800-282-6789 to get all the details. It takes just a couple of minutes. These amazing braces have helped thousands of people in severe pain, and you may qualify to have yours delivered directly to your door at little or no cost to you. Call 1-800-282-6789 right now. This may be the most important call you make all year. That's 800-282-6789. Call now. Sunday, September 14th at 3 p.m., there'll be a oldies dance and spaghetti dinner at the White Lake Eagles. For a $5 donation, all money to benefit Terry Osbo and her kidney transplant surgery. We'll also have items for raffle, like jewelry, gift certificates, tanning and hair care items, Harley Davidson shirts, Bud Light Grill, a cooler in the shape of a canoe, Michigan Adventure tickets, wine tasting at Lemon Creek, hotel stays, and tons of oldies from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Sunday, September 14th at 3 p.m. at the White Lake Eagles in Whitehall. Attention hip replacement patients. Several metal-on-metal metal hip implants have been recalled, and a jury recently awarded $8.3 million to one hip replacement victim. Metal-on-metal metal hip implants can cause excruciating pain and may require expensive surgery to replace. If you had a metal-on-metal metal hip replacement and it's been removed or it needs to be removed, call the Goldwater Law Firm right now. I'm attorney Bob Goldwater. Metal-on-metal metal hip replacements can be dangerous. If you have a metal-on-metal metal hip implant, even even if it hasn't failed yet, call us right now. You may be entitled to substantial compensation. The manufacturer of your defective hip implant should have to pay for your medical expenses and your pain and suffering. Your time to act is quickly running out, so call us right now. If you have a metal-on-metal metal hip replacement and it's been removed or is causing you problems, call 1-800-540-9516. That's 1-800-540-9516. Welcome back to the Mike Hewitt Show. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Serko uh, Abbas, who is the pres um, president of the Kurdistan National Assembly of Syria. Uh, Serko, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Listen, I, d during our break, you sent me a map, so that I, so I got a, we're both looking at the same map now, and the differences were, were, were very minimal between what I was looking at, so we're, we're both on the same page. Um, what I wanted to what I wanted to see if we couldn't segue to is what impact what's going on. There's a, a relatively a civil war in Syria uh, with Assad is still in power. I, I want to get a feel for what your take of that circumstance is, and then of course how that is impacting the Kurdish population. Okay, well, Assad obviously he's doing whatever it takes to survive. That means uh, not leaving. Uh, any building intact, and and he is uh, trying to do whatever it takes to uh, stay in power. That means killing hundreds of thousands. In fact, more than 200,000 people have been killed, uh, and maybe even more. Uh, they they are declared are missing. 
uh, or in jail, but nobody knows their fate uh, of those people. So that gives you an idea, you know, roughly close to a quarter million people been killed and uh, more than six million people uh, internally displaced and additional two and a half million people uh, displaced externally. And from that three quarter million Kurds were displaced. So right there is the impact on us is demographic changes because relatively our area is much uh, safer at the moment because Kurds did not uh, took sides. They tried to stay out of it because uh, we mentioned this uh, uh, going back from 2004 when the first major, uh, uh, like a million uh, folks uh, who uprised in Syria, more than a million, most Kurds uprised in Syria against the regime of Assad in 2004. Unfortunately, nobody helped us at the time, and Assad killed 65 people, and, and thousands were injured. Uh, and uh, But at the time, he was fearful. They were uh, 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 American were in Iraq, and Kurds of Iraq were gaining some leverage. And American had forced him out of Lebanon, uh, Assad, uh, and, and basically uh, Bush reputation uh, being a uh, promoting democracy and bringing uh, regime change in Iraq and liberating Iraqi. Frankly, we, we look at it as a liberation. Other people call it occupation. And we salute uh, uh, President Bush for his uh, work in Iraq. Um, but unfortunately, it was short. So he was a, a nervous, uh, didn't kill millions or hundreds of thousands of people, but uh, agreed to uh, resolve the Kurdish issue, which he never did. But to go back a little bit, a couple years down the road, uh, when the beginning of the Syrian uh, uh, revolution started, the group, democratic group in Kurds among them, and we met with the senior people from the White House, State Department, and Congress on this issue, is many of them, uh, frankly, on the Congress and Senate were positive. Uh, on the Senate, uh, as I mentioned, Congress were very positive. On the State Department and the White House were negative. They were pushing us in the direction to support group that we know they were Muslim Brotherhood groups, and we t and they're Arab fascist. Uh, and and we told them that, and they basically said, forget the Kurdish issue, bring the regime and change in Syria and we'll discuss later democracy. And this is uh, something uh, we could not take a risk. Uh, so the Kurds stayed uh, on the sideline. We predicted to the State Department, to the uh, White House, that the, all the groups are Islamist, and they're anti, uh, they would be anti-Western, anti-value, and eventually could be worse than Assad because they were part of Assad, they part of the same culture, same upbringing for 40, 50 years, and overnight, it cannot be democratic. Therefore, we need a mechanism up front, and we need to have the Kurds become a major element or core of this opposition because we were organized, we've been doing it for many years, and we have uh, tolerance for others, and we're not a pro-radical group as uh, those groups were being uh, supported. Unfortunately, the U.S. government did not provide a single dollar, not even help or humanitarian to our area to this day. All that help goes into the radical group, and some of them, unfortunately, they captured Americans and, and they cut their Americans' uh, uh, head off. This is uh, the administration continues to support those groups, and we've been saying that to them many, many times, and and they still continue to deal with those type of radical group. Yeah, circle, so the, the, circle for ahead. for a fellow like me, it's a little bit difficult to to get my head around that. I'm reading. The, the position statement that anyone can look at if they Google the Kurdistan National Assembly of Syria, and it discusses a position paper, uh, uh, what, 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 you, what you folks are advancing as a Syria free of the oppression of the dictatorial and Ba'athist regime, and then it lists, I, I, I teased you a little bit off the air, it reads a little bit as if Thomas Jefferson wrote it. And so I'm, I read that, and I'm trying to understand what would cause a White House in America, uh, a, a United States administration, to not support you? Now, now listen, let me be clear, though. I tend to be a little bit of a non-interventionist. So on one hand, I, I guess I'm, I'm slightly conflicted. On one hand, I think 
these are areas that we shouldn't risk our U.S. soldiers and treasury in. On the other hand, I think if we stand by and watch tens of thousands of people be slaughtered and we do nothing when we could have done something, then I feel we're just as guilty, uh, especially with a group of folks that is, that's calling for uh, essentially how I'm interpreting this. Your folks are calling for a, a federal system of government that gives uh, local sovereignty to different different ethnicities and religions. I mean, like I say, it reads like Thomas Jefferson wrote it. And so it just it's so foreign to me that our United States government is not doing something to support uh, what you folks are calling for in a region that desperately needs exactly what you're calling for. Uh, it's an interesting question because I posed that question when I was told uh, to join the Syrian National Coalition and Syrian National Council. In other words, the Kurds should support that all their weight and work with the Syrian opposition, and we clearly told them this is a supported by Qatar, by Saudi, petrodollars, Gulf, <clears throat> and by Turkey. And obviously those groups are Islamist, radical, and, uh, and at times they make al-Qaeda uh, like moderate. So you need to look at that. If you think al-Qaeda is, is, uh, is terrible, these guys, um, <laughs> you haven't seen it. And the answer we, we got, you need to do a regime change. The democracy will come in and forget the federalism because nobody will buy the federalism in that region. And my uh, uh, question is why it, a federalism good for you, American, and it's not good for somebody else, uh, And uh, unless you really don't believe in that. And uh, he smiled, the senior uh, advisor to the uh, White House, and he kind of smiled. He said, well, my suggestion to you guys, if you want to get any assistance or help uh, to do that. Uh, since then, uh, they've been very restrictive and not allowing our people to come for visas or to, to present our case to the Congress. They make an every effort to make it difficult for us. I think the only reason, as I mentioned earlier, again, uh, that money that pour in from Arab nation that they want to keep the Kurds at bay and not have their country because they know the Kurdistan was split, given part chunk of it to Turkey, to Iran, to Iraq, to Syria. If there's a gain in that area, there will be a democracy. Having 30, 40 million people where um, uh, majority are Muslim Kurd, where they say <clears throat> we cannot fight people of the book, whether being Christian or Jews, we cannot fight Jews for Jerusalem or uh, or Palestinian for uh, for Arab uh, issues because in, even in Quran it uh, it says uh, it, you, uh, Jews are favored by God and the Israel belongs to them and we cannot fight them and we uh, if you fight them you go to hell uh, so this is our upbringing in Islam of a Kurdish Islam is moderate uh, it promotes in in, in fact uh, Salah al Din was the first one allowed all the Jews in millions to return to uh, Jerusalem. So uh, they don't want this. Arab wants to use Islam, and they use their perverted uh, way of Islam and interpret and control and, 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 and uh, promote the radicalism in that area. So the influence they have, the dollar they have, uh, the petrodollars they have on this administration. And frankly, one guy from the uh, State Department told me, hey, listen, I'm here for several years as a vehicle. I'll go to be a consultant in the Gulf and make the... Uh, more interest. How many how many Kurdish embassies here? Uh, I said none. He said exactly. So uh, so th there's a number of people also working for their interest as well, uh, that, uh, keeping the Kurdish issues at bay. So we see Kurdish issues as essential. We have the same values as America, and we're asking whatever's for America. And the Kurds have demonstrated for a hundred years that they're not radical, and they don't use radicalism and killing in that other people's use. Uh, so I think it should be supported, uh, especially so. Uh, at this moment, because you have a choice, uh, either for Assad, which is uh, against our values, or the radical, which is, makes al-Qaeda the moderate, which is even worse, cutting it off. So why not help the Kurds where they can stop this uh, type of group? Tell me, tell me if I'm off base here. It sounded like, well, let me condense down what I think I heard you said. Say, it sounded like you're telling me that you were told by senior senior members of the White House that, um, there are two points, A, that your people are not ready for democracy, and B, money is more important than doing what's right. Is that kind of what I got out of that? Uh, the, the, B, the B was uh, uh, yes, and uh, I guess the A, it's not your people not ready. 
it's basically uh, this is what it's going to be. In other words, without explaining, meaning this is not the area where, where democracy matters. Basically, it comes down to the same thing, which is all one issue, which is the money and influence that those nations have on this administration. What What is the primary, and I, I've read a little bit today, Shurko, so you have to bear with me, but tell me what, if, if we look at the, the Kurdish people, what's the primary religion? I know there's a bunch of religions, but what's the primary <clears throat> religion of the Kurdish people? Well, um, the, the primary one is uh, uh, Islam. Uh, if you look at the Kurds, probably 90 Three ninety-four percent, maybe ninety percent uh, uh, Muslim. The other one is um, second, come after that, Jewish. Uh, third is a Christian, and the fourth one is Yazidi, which is Zara Zara Dashti. Uh, it going back almost four or five thousand, even before um, uh, Judaism. Uh, right. uh, that uh, religion is, still exists, which nope. is uh, yeah, call them Yazidis now. Uh, nowadays in Iraq, that's the uh, Al-Qaeda or a jihadi group or Khan. Now listen, I, 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 I have to tell you, Sharko, the reason I ask you that question, and I have, a, I have a point, and you tell me if I'm off base, but what we hear on our American TVs all of the time, uh, as, it, as it relates to Islam in, in, from our talking heads on TV, from our leaders in Washington, D.C., is that we need to hear from moderate Islamists, moderate Muslims to stand up and tell the extremists that they're wrong. And what I'm hearing you say is that's who we are and that's what we're trying to do, and no one's giving us a platform. Is that right? Uh, you're absolutely right. Having, uh, again, I always say this, having 40-plus million Kurds, and then forget even the Kurds, look at other Berbers. In North Africa, most of them are Amarazi or Berbers. You look at these people, they teach the same uh, uh, tolerance in terms of accepting uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam as a way. These are books of God, and you cannot really kill anybody, and you cannot uh, uh, use that. Uh, in essence, uh, they don't have any problem with American allies, Israel there, and they have no problem with American values. Yet those people have been excluded. They said we cannot find these moderate. They cannot find moderate people among the people who are cutting heads off. This is the problem. They are not looking. And when we try to approach them, they don't give us the platform. Uh, as I'll give you an example, we have tried to attend a couple conferences to bring key leader, including the influence we have on other Arab moderate or Christian or other groups, to come to the U.S. and approach the administration or the Congress. They always try to block us by not allowing them to get visas or create problems for them, and even these well-known figures and everything they say promotes the value of, of what Americans trying to say on, on TV, but in reality, they always go find the radical and work with them. Is it, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit stumped, to, I, to be honest with you. I'm not convinced I understand what would be, what would be the reason that our, uh, our, our administration would seek out the radicals like the Muslim Brotherhood. When, uh, there, when there's folks like you saying, we are, if I got to tell you candidly, before you came on today, I spent about an hour trying to find a time in history where the Kurdish people were aggressive. And the only thing I can find is defensive postures for 100 years. And so I'm thinking, <laughs> these are the people I want to embrace, not the people that are cutting off well, heads. Cyrus the Great uh, freed the Jews and, and promoted tolerance of all religion. And right. today they say he's a Persian. He's not. He's a Kurdish. The name Cyrus has mean Kalrash. Kalrash in Kurdish. It's a black bird in Kurdistan, the name of it. And that's to this day, we, you know, we, again, the Kurds are, uh, in terms of uh, women having role, first robbed by a woman who was from Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, the Kurds have been always women and, and men working along the side. They've been um, tolerance in marriage uh, uh, between Muslim and Christian or Jews uh, uh, for the Kurds. So they have been this tolerant in view um, uh, that is not radical and absolutely uh, a positive on promoting our values and democracy in the Middle East. But uh, again, look, Qatar bought uh, the <laughs> for the soccer or football uh, uh, Teams, or uh, when I call uh, for Olympic, um, sorry, my mind went blank for a second. 
uh, you know, trying to promote uh, bringing a lot of things into Qatar and uh, Al Jazeera behind it and the millions of, of dollars that they have, they influence this administration. And uh, obviously, uh, as I go back, Saudi, uh, on one hand, they uh, support radicals, and the other hand, they say we're fighting radicals. So they have to pick a choice. You know, they cannot promote these groups. And the U.S. administration need to find a way either um, really deal firmly with those nations, because the same people that they blew up nine, uh, you know, look at the trade world trade centers, those, most of them were Saudis. Um, and the same groups today fighting in Syria as well. Uh, so my feeling is that administration is listening to petrodollars. They have billions at their disposal in Qatar and Saudis and United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, all those nations, they promote the group that uh, uh, at the best right now, Muslim Brotherhood Plus. I, I got to tell you, I, just, I, I get the concept of the money and the oil. What makes no sense to me is I'm watching ISIS as an example, running around cutting people's heads off. I, they don't appear to be uh, stable enough at the scary. That will probably change, but they don't appear to be stable enough now to be a force of oil or a force of money. I just can't fathom why we continue to to uh, encourage groups like Muslim Brotherhood who share membership with members of ISIS. Listen, we're going to go to a break. We'll be right back, and, and when we come back, I want to talk about what role the U.S. should be playing there. Folks, we'll be right back. Sunday, September 14th at 3 p.m., there'll be a oldies dance and spaghetti dinner at the White Lake Eagles. For a $5 donation, all money to benefit Terry Osbo and her kidney transplant surgery. We'll also have items for raffle, like jewelry, gift certificates, tanning and hair care items, Harley Davidson shirts, Bud Light Grill, a cooler in the shape of a canoe, Michigan Adventure tickets, wine tasting at Lemon Creek, hotel stays, and tons of oldies from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Sunday, September 14th at 3 p.m. at the White Lake Eagles in Whitehall. Attention hip replacement patients. Several metal-on-metal metal hip implants have been recalled, and a jury recently awarded $8.3 million to one hip replacement victim. Metal-on-metal metal hip implants can cause excruciating pain and may require expensive surgery to replace. If you had a metal-on-metal metal hip replacement and it's been removed or it needs to be removed, call the Goldwater Law Firm right now. I'm attorney Bob Goldwater. Metal-on-metal metal hip replacements can be dangerous. If you have a metal-on-metal metal hip implant, even if it hasn't failed yet, call us right now. You may be entitled to substantial compensation. The manufacturer of your defective hip implant should have to pay for your medical expenses and your pain and suffering. Your time to act is quickly running out, so call us right now. If you have a metal-on-metal metal hip replacement and it's been removed or is causing you problems, call 1-800-540-9516. That's 1-800-540-9516. I've made a discovery. The down-home community our grandparents loved is still here. Seriously, that's what you'll find at Renegade River in downtown Spring Lake. You might be looking for a new or used hunting rifle or something for personal defense. Maybe a DNR sport license or fishing supplies. Personal and home defense. Hunting, Army, Navy supplies, fishing, survival gear, and even a tools and guy stuff consignment department. You'll be greeted by low prices and quick professional service provided by shopkeeper Mike Hewitt. If you're not in a hurry, grab a cup of coffee and join in the conversation. Renegade River, firearms, hunting, personal protection and survival gear, going camping or looking for emergency products. Come take advantage of the prices while meeting up with old friends and making new ones. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Or go to the website RenegadeRiver.com uh, Welcome back to the Mike Hewitt Show with my guest today, Dr. Sherko Abbas, who is the president of the Kurdistan National Assembly of Syria. Uh, Sherko, welcome back. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to do is spend our, spend our last segment um, on trying to get a view 
of what the U.S. role should be. But before I get to that, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm reading an article dated today's date um, um, uh, from World News, I think it is, uh, the enemy of my enemy, and then it says the I- Iran arms Kurds and fight against ISIS. You've been following this, I'm guessing? Uh, obviously, Iran is uh, trying to play it uh, smart by uh, showing to the world that ISIS, uh, uh, they're against ISIS and they're moderate, and uh, therefore, uh, obviously, they want to help the Kurds up because, frankly, all the help that you see on the media that we're helping, we're doing airstrike, all those, I would categorize it as a help to show that we're doing something, it's not a real help. I see. Uh, make-believe help. So it's, it's like window dressing, it's just... Window dressing, absolutely. Uh, if they have not given a very heavy weapon to the Kurds. Uh, the ISIS had the most sophisticated American weapon where the Iraqi army left behind. <laughs> And the Kurds, uh, uh, some of the weapons they have uh, that go back to 70s and 80s or uh, whatever was left from uh, 1991 when Saddam left that area. Since then, very minimum weapon going to the Kurds. Most of the weapon, uh, it is, uh, went to the Iraqi army. American did not give to the Kurds from 2005. American uh, have... Uh, request by the Kurdish Peshmerga according to the agreement of the Iraqi constitution to arm the Kurds to this day. They were not given the weapon. American, they said we need uh, Iraqi prime minister to approve it, and he wouldn't approve it. Tell me this then, if be, given the resources that are in the general region, we we discussed a little bit about what the, the U.S., what, what, what the White House's <clears throat> agenda seems to be, but I'm curious where Russia plays into this. Has Russia got an eye, an eye on some of those resources also? Absolutely. But I want to add one point. What is ISIS? Obviously, ISIS, it was a instrument that Iran and Syria used cleverly against Americans in Iraq to kill Americans, and they used them. Now, uh, most of those guys have absolutely uh, no interest in Islam. Those groups, Assad, unleashed them. Uh, to basically send a message to the world, alternative is worse. Basically, ISIS was under control of Assad until just a couple months ago. In Syria, in fact, uh, the Hasaka region, the Kurdish region, in uh, Aleppo, Afrin area, is still under Assad. There are some, ISIS is not a one group, there are many groups. So a uh, majority of them were under the leadership of Iran and Assad. It was used to portray the, the international community, the alternative is a terrible thing. And here, what they're doing, and two, to scare the Kurds and the Christian, the stick at least not applies against Assad, and to keep himself look uh, better. Uh, so that's what really ISIS uh, was. However, um, a lot of help from Saudi given to Ba'athists in Iraq, as at the Duri, one of the Saddam's strong guys that American couldn't capture him uh, uh, several months ago, where he basically, uh, the disgruntled Sunnis that they were uh, in Iraq and Syria started to also join that. So it grew up. If you categorize the whole ISIS, not even 10,000 people. But what happened, many of those were well-armed, had a lot of money, and well-organized, but also because states were behind them. Iran, Russia, Syria were behind some of these groups. Again, it was all this is the message. You want to change Assad, this is what you'll get. I think, uh, I th- he- I think their miscalculation was they've not read history because uh, the, the Kurds, as you are aware, are some fierce yeah. fighters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and so, so this is what happened uh, uh, in essence. Now things are getting out of control. Who's going to win? What's going to happen? We don't know. But American obviously need to really decide, not help Assad and not help peace. And I think the best option is to help the Kurds and let minorities at least have a safe haven, the Christian, other minorities, Yazidis, whoever it is, the democratic groups, so to really move to the Kurdistan and work with the Kurds. And this is the only way to root these guys out. But we cannot keep Iran 
uh, in Syria and in, in Russia out of this because they have some hands in there, either directly or indirectly. But at the very least, uh, for sure, Assad had hands. And uh, to give you an example, in Hasaka Abu Ali, he used to be in charge of uh, intelligence, and he's an Alawite leading a Sunni so-called group. So <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So the only thing you can think of it is to use it to suddenly you, you, show, you show something worse than what he was to make him look better, positive to the world and uh, to stop the support and have the world community go against uh, or help them against these people. And it looks like they're slowly uh, American thinking about doing something. But again, the red line is going to shift and shift. Yeah, uh, and nobody knows. Maybe it will stop. Up in, in Delaware somewhere. President Obama is very good at drawing red lines. He reminds me a little bit of of uh, Muammar Gaddafi with the with the endless red lines. Cross this, okay. Cross this, okay. Uh, but but what I just just to re I want to make sure I interpreted what you told me. You're saying that most of the groups that make up ISIS were born of either Syrian or Iranian state money and assets. Absolutely. Yeah. They used it very well in Iraq against American. Uh, and then only when Iraqi, uh, the surge in Iraq, uh, bringing Iraqi Sunnis, they crushed it. And, and also threat to Assad that he basically pulled that when American decided to leave. Then he pulled them, put them all in prison. And then he unleashed them uh, after the revolution just to make everybody look um, uh, show the world what is alternative. It's, does, has it gotten to the point now? I'm assuming it has, where ISIS has become powerful enough and independent-minded enough that they're no longer interested in what Syria or Iran are telling them to do? Well, obviously, uh, if, if there was all one group, uh, again, there's uh, probably more than 30 to 40 organizations and groups, and there's many people that also went from uh, Saudi or Gulf countries uh, from around the world, from Europe, from U.S., that the uh, hardcore believer went to the aid of these. So there are some groups behind the scenes still Iran and Syria's hands in there, but eventually, uh, obviously, it will get out of control. And some groups are, are uh, completely against those uh, nations now, against those regimes now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, you have to look how uh, these countries they manipulate. They have a, one of the superpower or at least now we start to become superpower as we lack of leadership in Washington, uh, is Russia now. And they support with Iran's money and, uh, of course, Iraq's money and Syria's money to help those groups. And with American weapon and technology left behind, these guys are gaining ground. Eventually, it will be a problem for those countries. And maybe that's why you know, they start to show some interest helping the Kurds to at least reduce that uh, and at the same time, divide and conquer, weaken the Kurds and weaken them at the same time. Do you think, do you think um, that at some point, um, separate from your goal, but do you think at some point Syria is going to break up into pieces? Uh, you know, as um, Secretary of State Kissinger said recently, um, it's a failed state and it should be treated uh, and, and should be uh, broken to pieces. I agree. It should be at the very minimum uh, a loose confederation where the north of the country, the Kurdish, and let the Kurds uh, bring the positive into Syria. But the way the U.S. government approaching it is absolutely not going anywhere because all their approach is finding, uh, looking at the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood is Hamas. Exactly. And bringing, those, bringing these people... Um, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, uh, our feeling there's many more Arab groups, Christian, Kurds, other minority are willing to believe in the federal system, like whatever is good for America, the same system in that region. I think this is the approach should be. And, uh, and frankly, this administration is not looking for that. What, what, uh, but for just, just for the last few minutes we've got, Shurko, tell me, if, what, what are the two or three or four things that you would like to see the United States be doing? Uh, I, would say, I would say the first, uh, at the very least, uh, support the Kurds of Iraq uh, to go their way independent instead of forcing them to keep Iran, Iraq in the, as a whole one piece for Iranian to rule. And uh, in my feeling, the Kurdistan of Iraq should be independent. Uh, at 
the second, the court of Syria, at the very minimum, a federal, if not even joining Iraqi Kurdistan as a one nation, should be supported uh, politically and militarily, should be supported. We're not asking for American boots on the ground. We're asking, give us a help weapon. And, and we have more than 100 years showing to the world that we have uh, no bad uh, uh, experiences and we have uh, same values. So we want to fight, but we need weapons that we can uh, help defend ourselves and stop this group. You know, again, this group, if they have all the oil of the Kurdish region in Syria and Iraq in their hand and all the money that they have at their disposal, these guys, no dummies, they can reach uh, our U.S. Uh, anytime in uh, Europe for sure. Uh, and so we need to really stop this momentum. And the only way to really stop it, the Kurds. You cannot try to keep Syria and Iraq together and save it, because if you do, you're saving it for Iran. So uh, it just as equally bad. Let me let me say two things. First off, Sherko, when I, in regards to ISIS and not being able to stop them or the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, frankly, I think they're already within the borders of the United States. And I, I think that another 9-11 level attack is not possible, but it's extraordinarily probable. Um, and, and in fact, I, unless some dramatic uh, course changes on our policies take place, you can almost guarantee it will will happen. But that said, when I when I look at the American role in, in, in that region, I think the American people in general are war weary. Having said that, but to, and, and frankly, to your point, I don't think that we can stand down and allow ISIS to become a state of its own. And we, and, and so if the American people are reluctant to put boots on the ground, but we've already got advisors in the area and planes doing some kind of pseudo no-fly zones, the idea that we're not partnering with the, the Kurds, to me, is insanity. You're there. You know the terrain. You know the people. You clearly, to your point, have a hundred years of being some a very aggressive uh, uh, capacity to defend. I, to me, I think it's a perfect marriage. I don't see how our administration could arrive at any other conclusion. You know, I said this to uh, Elliot Abram, uh, uh, one of the key guys for uh, Bush administration a while back, that 150, 200,000, 400,000, half a million American boots on the ground, it's not going to make a difference. Because right. What you need is people who understand the language, the culture, the people of that area, the terrain, and they know how to uh, control it and also promote a counter to this ideology of going, killing, slaughtering, and destroying women and children and everybody else. We need to counter that. We need to counter this idea of going, destroying Israel and Jewish and killing anybody that is not a Muslim. We need to, uh, and the only group is promoting that for more than 100 years, and you can ask Israelis uh, on this as well. Uh, and there's a hundred, uh, close to 200,000 Kurds in, in Jerusalem as well. Uh, they can tell you and explain to you what the Kurds been doing. And so the Kurds could be the element, the engine of democracy in the Middle East. This is a positive, you know, you have 40 million people and slowly they can make the change uh, uh, and stop this radical group, uh, unfortunately, the U.S. government is Doesn't. not doing enough uh, for some reason. And the only reason we can think of is petrol dollars and the interests of those nations have on this yeah, administration. No question. Dr. Boss, we're out of time. But listen, i got to tell you, I think the average American would sleep better knowing that there was a federation or a Republican form of government in that area with Kurdish rule. Sir, thank you very, very much for joining us today, and I hope to have you back on again. Thank you very much. I appreciate it for inviting me, and I uh, enjoyed it. Thank you, folks. We'll see you next week. Brought to you by Renegade River. A minute discovery. The down-home community our grandparents loved is still here. Seriously, that's what you'll find at Renegade River in downtown Spring Lake. You might be looking for a new or used hunting rifle or something for personal defense. Maybe a DNR sport license or fishing supplies. Personal and home defense. Hunting, Army, Navy supplies. Fishing, survival gear, and even a tools and guy stuff consignment department. You'll be greeted by low prices, 
and quick professional service provided by shopkeeper Mike Hewitt. If you're not in a hurry, grab a cup of coffee and join in the conversation. Renegade River, firearms, hunting, personal protection and survival gear, going camping or looking for emergency products. Come take advantage of the prices while meeting up with old friends and making new ones. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Or go to the website, renegaderiver.com.